Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Bill alcoholic. It's the first meeting I've ever been to where they actually ask you if you'd like to go to detox. You know? Kind of sounding pretty good there. Um, I also want to know if you people are going to pay for the shows that we signed up to see for the next two or three days. That'd be nice. You know, see Bob Darrell. <laughs> It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's my second time here, and last time you were at a nice carpeted little place. It was nice. I see you've moved up to the gymnasium. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Our 10-minute speaker was a real tough guy. I, on the other hand, was a pretender to the throne. <laughs> I was a surfer and a biker and a tough guy. And I never went to the beach. (laughs) My motorcycle rarely ran. And I was afraid to fight. But I looked really good. I had a chrome Nazi helmet for a hat and a primary chain for a belt and black greasy Levi's and big black boots with chains around them. I've got tattoos all over me. But I had a clip-on earring because I didn't want to hurt myself. (laughs) I I see there's some other phonies in the room. (laughs) I always figured if I was a tough guy like this guy, I'd be okay. And he's sitting here with me. (laughs) But there's some people that really need their ass kicked, you know? (laughs) Don't you think? I remember one time asking my sponsor, isn't there ever a time... When somebody can just say the wrong thing and you get to slap the shit out of them (laughs) and not have to make amends. It means, isn't there a time, you know? And he looked at me and grinned and he goes, I don't think so. (laughs) But that's my story. That's what it was like. You know, by the time I was 17 years old, I was a bad drunk in high school. I had a bit of a problem with authority. And I had the slouch, and I had the foul mouth, and I had the big jacket, and and you could not talk to me. I mean, I was was irretrievable. Um, You see those kids today, you know. I mean, I look at sometimes I see myself, you know, and... uh, and I watch people try to communicate with them, and I, I just know how they feel inside. I didn't have anger. I had rage. I don't think alcoholics know much about anger. Anger can be an appropriate emotional response to a negative situation. Rage, on the other hand, is an old buddy. Now, you can get off on rage. And I, I don't know where the hell it came from, but I had this double over, fall on the floor, Bile from the stomach up into the throat, eyes bulging, veins bulging, fist into the wall, head into the wall, just pissed off at the injustice of it all. And my mother looked at that and said, there's something wrong with the boy. Because it really wasn't that bad at home, you know? I mean, I don't know where that came from. I don't know that it's really that necessary to even find out. One thing I'm pretty clear on today that all I really need to know about my childhood is it's over. <laughs> you know? It's over. You know? And uh, so my mother sent me to my first shrink when I was 13. I hadn't started drinking or doing anything. I'm a child of the 60s. I graduated from high school in 1965. And it was a great time to be getting loaded. You'll hear speakers say, I wouldn't trade my worst day sober for my best day drunk. I wouldn't trade 66 and 67 for anything. (laughs) I mean, 
I think it was pretty cool. You know, I mean, it was like, it sure seemed like it. Uh, the memories of it are just ecstatic, you know. I mean, the road from Los Angeles to San Francisco was the road to Nirvana. Golden Gate Park was the center of the universe. And they weren't eating hitchhikers yet, so it was safe to travel, you know. <laughs> And the young ladies were discovering their sexuality, and we were helping them as best we could. You know, you know. I mean, it was. You stop and think about it. Stop and think about it. They were burning their bras. Now you tell me, there's no God, huh? What is that? I mean, the best thing we could come up with was draft cards, you know? I mean, they were... Um, so I went to my first shrink when I was 13 because I had rage. I had rage. And uh, by the time I was 22 years old, I was in the Oregon State Mental Institution. I needed a rest. I mean, it's rough out there changing the world, you know? And, uh, but wasn't the whole idea this drinking thing? Wasn't the whole idea was to have a party, wasn't it? Wasn't that the idea? I mean, the idea was to have a few drinks, get out of the house, and go to the party, have some adventures, meet her, get lucky, have a good time. Wasn't that it? I ended up naked in my living room watching religious television, taking notes. I'm having sex, menage a uno. <laughs> There's no one else in the room. You know, we're, we're party. You know, we're partying with Billy now. It's getting serious, you know. It's, so I knew guys come in and they say, well, I was just a party kind of guy. And I go, describe the party to me. That last few months, you know. I mean, how many other people were with you? You know, having these adventures, you know. <clears throat> Breathe. Yeah. Yeah. So in nineteen sixty six. I was at Bass Lake, and the Hell's Angels rolled in there on July 4th. And uh, I found my career path. And uh, I met her, and we went up to Oregon to grow our own. We had a couple of kids, bought a house, set up housekeeping. And uh, in the end of that, um, I was running with an outlaw motorcycle gang. I'm sticking needles in my arm every day and drinking like a fish. And I wasn't coming home to that family, and they were on welfare. And, you know, the way you end up in a mental institution is not because you had a bad week. You have to build up a level of toxicity to qualify for the mental institution. And I have to remember the first time I went to the mental institution, because there was more than one, um, I have to remember, this is a critical part of the story, I called the police on myself. Now, in Alcoholics Anonymous, there is a controversy that rears its ugly head from time to time because there aren't really very many issues in AA, so we have to keep recycling the old ones. And the controversy is that, that comes up every so often is the alcoholic and the drug addict, are they the same, are they different, and, and all this stuff. Well, anybody that's been out there on the street knows that there's a difference between alcoholics and drug addicts. And I'll give you an operational example of that difference. No self-respecting drug addict would ever call the police on himself. <laughs> but an alcoholic will do it and think that it's a pretty good idea. <laughs> there is a level of lameness in the alcoholic that simply does not exist in the hip contemporary rock and roll drug addict of today. You know? All those in favor? I'll call New York. <laughs> so I'm in the mental institution. I lost a family, essentially. Uh, you know, I lost the kids and the wife, and I lost a house, and I lost a couple of cars, and I lost some jobs, and 
and I'm in a nut house. I'm 22 years old, and I'm in a mental institution, a lockdown mental institution. So the party didn't last very long, did it? And for most of us, I think that's true. You know, we all talk about, well, I drank for 20 or 25 years. How much of that time was the party happening? How much of that time? You don't need any other proof that alcoholism is physiological other than that last three to five years that you and I stayed out there. No one would consciously do that to themselves. No one. If they had any choice, because there's no party. It's not fun. It's maintenance. It's getting through the day. You know, there's no party happening. And, uh, but I was doomed to do it for another 15 years. I got out of the... Anybody else here been in a mental institution? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of you out there saying, well, it really wasn't an institution. <laughs> they were just observing me, you know. <laughs> Only those of us that have been in a mental institution know that it's not that bad. You have some sparkling conversations in the mental institution, you know. It's a great place to look for a bride. I'd like to introduce you to my wife, Karen. Say hi, honey. I did not find her in the mental institution, unless you count AA. Be good. So I got out of the nut house, and I came back down to Los Angeles, where, I, where I'm a native. And uh, one of the requirements for being an alcoholic is that you have to hate your parents. It's a prerequisite. Guys come in and they say, I love my mom and dad. They were really good to me. And I go, you need to drink some more. You, you have not thought this out very clearly. They are the source of all your misery, you know. And uh, so I hated my parents. Um, it's kind of interesting. A strange thing happened, I should add, to the story that when I was six years old, my dad got fired from a job, and uh, rather than go to the bar, he came home. And he said to my mother, he says, you know, I need some help. And I'm pretty sure it was my mother that called AA. And he went to a meeting uh, on Western Avenue, in Inglewood um, in 1954. And he came back from that meeting and he said to my mother, he says, you know, those people have got something down there and I'm going to go back and find out what it is. So the next night, my mother went with him in order to monitor the situation. And they walked into this Alano club together and this woman came up to my mother and asked her why she was there. And my mother says, well, I'm here to make sure that he signs the form correctly and pays the dues and talks to the right people. And this woman took my mother into the other room. <laughs> when my father died in 1999, he was 45 years sober. And my mother died in 2002, and she was 48 years in Al-Anon. And uh, so on top of all my other problems which are extensive. I was raised in AA. And I don't recommend it. Um, there's nothing worse than living in a house with two people with clear eyes that know exactly what's going on in your head. You know? I mean, you're going around the corner to smoke one and they're waiting for you going, where are you going? You know, they've been around the corner. You know, they, it was hell. But I had been to all the potlucks and the barbecues and, uh, you know. I mean, essentially what these people were doing back then, I've, I've come to understand, and I don't know even how conscious they were of it, but I know to a great degree they were conscious of what they were doing, is they were building Alcoholics Anonymous on the west coast of the United States, the AA that you and I enjoy today. That's what these people were doing. They were starting meetings, communicating with each other, and going to talk in the meetings, man, if you had two or three years sober, you were big stuff, you know. And the guys that had five and ten years sober, 
they were the commanders and chiefs. You know, this was it. This was their AA, and they were rabid. They were intense. My, they were, I, w- I grew up in a house where the big books were open. They actually read the damn thing. You know, it's like, and when you went on a 12-step call, there was nowhere to take them. You know, hospitals wouldn't take them. You know, the American Medical Association had only recently recognized it as a disease. Hospitals wouldn't take drunks. When you went on a 12-step call, you brought them home. And I have lots of memories of my dad leaving Goins and coming back with some fat Italian drunk guy, you know, sitting in my living room, and they're pointing at him and pounding on the book and telling him the same lame-ass stuff we tell him today. (laughs) Not much has changed, really, the message of AA. Not much has really changed. There's been things that have been added to it that are some are good, some are not so good, some we all all argue over some of it. But the basic down-home, straight-ahead message of Alcoholics Anonymous has really not changed much. And uh, But I grew up in that house. So when I came back down to Los Angeles from that uh, mental institution, I was walking back into the hotbed. My parents never preached to me about Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I was in that mental institution, I don't remember anybody. It was 1969, I think it was. I don't remember anybody talking to me about recovery or about AA or the 12 steps or anything like that. I mean, they may have, and maybe I wasn't paying attention, but I don't remember anything like that, you know. And and even in the mental institution, I had no intention of stopping drinking. I, I, I I can't recall back at that time. I mean, I was strung out really bad. And I needed, I needed to go somewhere. I needed to be taken off the street. It was frightening out there. And I was scared. I think I got scared into that place, you know. So I come back down here. Now, you can hate your parents, but when you need something, you can overlook certain things. <laughs> and my dad let me sleep in his garage, and he gave me a job in his machine shop in El Segundo. And I tried to get normal. What normal is is you got to quit shooting heroin because you can't find anybody to go along with the concept of social heroin use. It's pretty much a lifestyle, you know. You got to quit taking acid because you got to talk to people. You know. Do you ever notice people, you know, regular people have conversations, one person talks while the other one does not. And then they take turns. It's incredible. You know. And uh <clears throat> so you got to quit taking that, you know. You can only drink on the weekends because normal people have jobs. And they go to those jobs days in a row. I've watched them do it. I've, I swear. It's, it's another incredible thing. The same people that are able to communicate with each other, they go to work days in a row, and they do that week after week. Painful. And, uh, and when I drink, I don't show up no matter what. So... If I'm going to have a job, I need to only contain that drinking part on the weekend. So what you do during the week is you smoke pot because it's green and it's from God and it's not really drugs. and It's <clears throat> it's what you do in between getting really high. You know, it's, uh, it's maintenance. Because I don't know about you, but there has to be some cushion in me to cushion the impact of your personality on me. Because the impact of your personality on me is devastating. I cannot do you. You know, I just can't do it. And I need something to cushion the blow of that. Something. And so I tried the experiment of only drinking on weekends and smoking pot, and by the time 15 years roll by, I'm 37 years old, and the uh, the experiment has failed miserably. Another thing about getting normal is you got to find a woman. Uh, I can never, ever be alone. It is a group effort getting me through life. It takes a village, you know. And uh, that has not changed. That has not changed. I am not a standalone individual. I need lots of support. And, uh, And you can find volunteers out there. Don't make Al Anon jokes if you don't know what it is. But if you know what it is, you can make some great Al Anon jokes. <laughs> Stop and think of this. Think of the consciousness of an individual that would live with us on purpose. <laughs> what are they thinking? 
oh, this will be fun. You know? Something to do on the weekends. You know? It's kind of like restoring old cars or something, you know, I guess. It's, it's like a hobby. And, uh... So I met this woman. We set up housekeeping, had two more kids. I'm 37 years old, and I'm living in the house with that wife and those children, and I have no emotional connection to another living human being. And I don't know that. I don't know it's that bad. But I am not connected to you. I do not feel you in my life. I only feel how you impact my life. I don't feel what you feel. And I called my mother like any good gangster. You know, and I called my mother. Mom. <laughs> And it was just one more night, one more night, being up all night, and uh, being in the wrong place when the paper hits the porch, you know you're not going to make it to work, you know. You're, you feel your life slipping through your hands, you know, like sand in your hands. You can feel it going away. You know you're not a husband. You know you're not a father. You're not anything. You know? It doesn't matter what kind of house you're sitting in, whether it's a big one or a little one or it's in an alley. It's that incomprehensible demoralization, that sense of shame, a feeling of shame, guilt, all rolled into one. And you can't differentiate any one emotion from another. It just feels like shit. One more time. It's not even a new feeling. It's the same old feeling. And I remember having that last glass of wine, and I called my mother, and I said... Uh, I need some help. And she came right over, man, before I changed my mind, loaded me up in the car, and took me to a place in Costa Mesa called Starting Point. Now, she took me to that shrink when I was 13. And I spent a year and a half with that guy, and he helped me. And one of the things that he did for me, maybe the primary thing he did for me, is he introduced me to my favorite subject, me. That lifelong pursuit of self of fleshing me out. And I do psychotherapy extremely well. I enjoy it. I spent several times in a mental institution. I spent two and a half years in group therapy at one time. I've been to several psychologists for one thing or another. I've been gestalted and rolfed and primal screamed. I know more about myself than is safe to know. But it is my favorite subject. You'd love to have me in your group. I'm really interactive, you know. I mean, I just, I get right into it, you know. I have no problem telling you secrets about myself. Matter of fact, if the conversation lulls, I'll just make some stuff up, you know. And I, you know, I just, I do it really well. So my intention, when she came and got me, I had no idea, really. I think if I remember well enough, which is hard to do, I pretty much knew I had to stop drinking. I didn't know that I was actually going to pull that off. But something had to stop. I could feel like death coming up behind me. I was extremely ill. Um, I, you know, I have liver disease, and I, I was in trouble, you know, and I could feel it. Um, but I needed a rest, and I needed some therapy, and I needed some attention, you know. So she checked me in this place called Starting Point. I spent 35 days in there. While I was in there, they made me wear a sign around my neck. I had to make the sign. We made it in crafts. It was a little rectangular piece of cardboard with a string that went through it, and it said, I am not a counselor. Because <laughs> evidently there was some confusion about that. I used to help guys do their inventory, you know. I swear to God. I'd tell them, i say, put some homosexual stuff in there. It makes them think you're telling the truth. <laughs> they like to read about that. And you probably did. You just don't remember, you know? <laughs> well, I woke up with a couple of guys, but it wasn't anything serious. Uh... <laughs> it's like, good morning. Ooh. 
So we share in a general way, right? <laughs> so after 35 days, they let me out. <laughs> they let us out, you know. <laughs> Finally, we have to leave. You know? And I'll tell you something. When all the insurance money runs out, when they're all done gestalting and rolfing and primal screaming, when all that's over with, they send us to the world's aftercare program, AA. This is it. There are no referrals from Alcoholics Anonymous. There's no place you go where you walk in the door and you say to them, AA sent me here. <laughs> that place doesn't exist. This is the last house on the street. This is it. It's linoleum floors and metal folding chairs for the rest of our natural lives. <laughs> Party. <laughs> oh, God. So I stand in the back of the room at the first meeting. I stand at the back of the room, and you're all walking up to the podium saying, I'd like to thank God and my sponsor for my sobriety. And then the coup de grace is, Happy birthday to you. And I am mortified. I'm looking at my shoes, and I'm thinking, if they recorded themselves and played it back, they wouldn't talk this way. I mean, I, mean, I can't hear the music, and I don't know anybody in the room. I don't get it. Now, I've been raised in it. As a little boy, I can remember standing in a circle going, keep coming back, it works, you know? And I, but, but, you know, I'm, I was never, I wasn't part of it, really. I mean, I'm just hanging around the, I'm eating the donuts, you know? Now I'm in my old man's club. And I've got the big disease, the other disease that a lot of us suffer from. I've got the I'm too hip for AA syndrome. I'm too cool for AA. I'm, uh, this, this is not, this is beyond lame. Scott Redmond says, this has offered me a level of lameness that I did not know was available. <laughs> you know? And you gotta picture this. I'm fat, bald, and 40, and I think I'm too hip for AA. <laughs> you know? This is not denial. To be in denial, you actually have to know some shit. <laughs> You know, this is delusional. You know, this is a classic example of how I see the world. You know, I think I'm hip and I'm wrong. You know, now today, to me, there's nothing sadder than to watch somebody trying to be cool in, of all places, AA. I mean, this is where we get to drop all that, you know. I mean, the cool people are still out there doing it. We're the lame ones that lived, you know. And you got to lame up to get the program. You can't be hip and do AA, I don't think, you know. I mean, I think you kind of can get hip later. But to really do it, I think you have to fall in and just not ask any questions and just do it. I drove home that night and I thought to myself, I can't do this. I just, I can't do this. And then the next thought that comes to mind if you run out of options, is, well, then what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? You ever had anybody say to you, he's not emotionally available for me? You ever heard that one? Usually in family group, you know? You know what they mean by that? What they mean by that is that I've got something that they want and I'm withholding it. The truth is worse. I don't have it. <laughs> and what's worse than that is I don't know that I don't have it. You've convinced me that I've got it. And I'm helping you look for it. And this is going to go on forever. 
forever. I am absolutely convinced that what happened to you and I when we started drinking when we were teenagers is that we never grew up emotionally. And now, we're going to do it now. (laughs) And the chances of us doing that and looking good, really slim. (laughs) Really slim. Every one of us is going to get to wear the clown suit with the big nose and the floppy shoes and the whole thing. Every one of us. And so this whole thing about where am I going to go, what am I going to do, how am I going to get this life experience? If you want me to be emotionally available for you now that I'm sober, if you would like me to be there for you and really feel what you feel, be able to stand in your shoes, be a real partner, real intimacy, not pseudo-intimacy, not pretend intimacy, In AA, there is the illusion that we're being close to each other because we talk about heavy shit. But that is not intimacy. That's just me talking about myself again. And But it looks, it feels like I'm divulging, like I'm having trust in you. Believe me, I can index you to the next person. You know, I'm not close to you. I'm just talking about me again. If you really want me to be close to you and feel what you feel and be a partner in a shared life together, it's going to take about 10 years. And I'll promise you something. If all I do in that 10-year period is go to a lot of meetings, nothing will change. Nothing. It won't even get a little bit better. If I keep it to where I'm just going to lots of meetings and I'm not drinking in between, because there's an illusion in AA that if you go to lots of meetings, you're doing Alcoholics Anonymous. They'll even tell you things. A guy said to me the other day, he says, I went to New York and I asked him, what's the primary reason for people drinking? They stop going to meetings. So as long as I go to lots of meetings, I won't drink. Good luck. Maybe you won't drink, but I don't believe you'll grow up either. The reason people quit going to meetings is because all they had was meetings. That's all they had. And it got boring or painful. You know, because the fellowship of AA is something to be survived. You people won't keep me sober. You're guaranteed to piss me off. You know, you'll borrow money from me and you won't pay it back. You'll hit on my wife. I'll give you a job and you'll do a shitty job and somehow it'll be my fault. (laughs) That's my personal favorite. And then you won't show up to my birthday party after all I've done for you. You know? So you'll piss me off and I'll leave. So the fellowship isn't going to keep me sober. The fellowship isn't going to help me to grow up if all I'm doing is fellowshipping and going to meetings. So I asked a guy for help. I went up to a guy and I said, will you help me? I need a sponsor. And he said, be at my house Thursday at 5 o'clock. Read the doctor's opinion and make notes in the margin of what you agree with and what you don't agree with, and we'll discuss it. So I went home and I did my assignment. I read the doctor's opinion, which is the Roman numeral thing, before the real part of the book starts. And uh, I read that. And I made some notes because I was, I was beaten down, but I was still opinionated. And I, you know, I had read my notes. And I showed up to his house. Now, he did not trust me that I had read it, so he had me sit there and read it to him out loud. And I brought up my questions, and we discussed it. We talked about that chapter. And he said, there's a part in the doctor's opinion where it talks about there's different kinds of alcoholics, you know, the psychopath and seems normal in every other way except the way an effect alcohol has on him. And, you know, the, the guy that after a period of time he hasn't taken a drink, he thinks he can drink again, you know. And he asked me, which one are you? And we talked about it. And I said, well, I think I'm this one here. He says, well, circle it. Put a star next to it. You're in the book. And he explained to me that this book was written about me, not to me. It was written about me. 
and I should be able to find myself in there. And that if I can't find myself in there, there's a problem. But you found yourself in there, so now we're on the path. Let's go. The only thing that can help an alcoholic of that variety is a complete psychic change. And he discussed that with me. He told me, my job as your sponsor is to guide you through the process of the 12 steps that you might have this psychic change to bring a power into your life that can resolve your problems. He said, I would be happy to sit here and, and listen to you talk about what you think your problems are. And I would be happy to do that so that you will not share about them in the meetings. <laughs> that the meetings are for recovery from alcoholism, not about how your day went. Now, I didn't know any different. I didn't know to argue with him. I didn't know there was another way. I was a new guy in AA. And, and this guy was spending time with me, and it felt really good. He took the time. He spent time with me. I, I met with him every week for a long time, and we worked the steps. I did an inventory, and I did a fifth step. Now, my understanding, I had a great experience in AA. I had an experience that not a lot of people have in AA. I asked a guy to help me that was really willing to do it, that invited me into his house, and he actually sat and read the book with me. He didn't say to me, sure, I'll be your sponsor. Read the book. If you have some problems, give me a call. That happens a lot. And I had this experience. Now, as I'm going along in AA, I'm talking to other people, and they're telling me they're not having this experience. They're not doing that because I thought this is what you guys did. I thought there was like a handbook or something, you know. I mean, how would I know that, that there wasn't, that this was, I just asked a guy and I got this help. I believe that the most spiritual thing said in Alcoholics Anonymous is get in the car. Where are we going? Get in the car. Well, who else is going? What do you care? Get in the car. And I highly recommend that if somebody asks you to go somewhere, if you're new at NAA, or if, if you haven't had this experience that I'm describing, get in the car. Go with them. Guaranteed, it'll be weird. <laughs> you know? And if you're into weird, AA's got plenty of weird. You know? And plenty to go around. It's an adventure. It's exciting. It's strange. It's odd. You know, all the people are a little tweaked, you know? They don't behave correctly. You ever been in public places with alcoholics? It can be painful. You know, like, it's when one of them is misbehaving, I think to myself, thank God it's not me. <laughs> you know? And, uh, but he told me, get in the car. And for some odd reason, I went with him. We went on field trips visiting people in hospitals, you know? You know, we, we would go, he would read the book with me and we would do this inventory. What I understand about it now is, is that this whole idea and the first step, the powerlessness and the unmanageability is really good news. Some people say the first step says we're screwed. I disagree. I think the first step says you don't have to manage your life anymore. Retire. Relax. Back off. You know, you're powerless. You can't manage your life. Not because you're powerless. Your life is just plain unmanageable by you. And you're not following your instincts. You don't have any intuitive thoughts. You know, you're all balled up. You're all wrapped up in yourself. Back off. I think it's good news. I've taken this workload off my shoulders. The second step then becomes a logical thought progression. If I can't manage my life, we better get an outside manager. We have got to farm this out. We gotta bring somebody else in. We'll send it offshore. You know? We need a management. We need a new manager. The third step says, well, if we're gonna invite the new manager in, what do we do with him? Give him the job. My life and my will. Let's do it. People say to me, I'm stuck on the third step. Where? Well, I have an issue with God. So do I. Well, I don't think I believe in God. Well, neither do I. Nobody really does. Let's pray. Try that one. They have no response when you do that. Well, I'm an atheist. Well, me too. Let's pray. Rock and roll. We're not waiting for you to think well. You know? And uh, 
The fourth step is the listing of the life and will. The fourth step is the list. It's the resentments. It's the fears and the broken relationships. And the fifth step is the physical and literal turning it over. You know, you can't really do a third step without four and five, in my estimation. It's like you can't do a tenth step without a fifth step. You know, people talk about journaling and stuff. You know, once again, it's me talking to myself again. You know, if I'm going to reflect on the day, I need to tell somebody what I come up with. You know, I need to. T it's like when I reflect on a day and I think I was a really good boy today. I need to tell somebody that I think I'm a really good boy, you know. See if there's any buddy on my side, <laughs> you know, clear my thinking a little bit. Maybe somebody will say, no, Bill, you are a very good boy. Yes, you are, you know. Where does that stuff come from? <clears throat> Six and seven step, two paragraphs in the book, you say the prayer, it's over. I am not empowered. I'm not going to fix my character defects. The principle behind those two is willingness and humility. The eighth step is I make a list of people I owe the money to. The reason I'm stuck on the third step is because I'm getting closer to nine and there's no way I'm paying back the money. <clears throat> and I get to the ninth step and the ninth step is about making the pot right. The ninth step is when the psychic change really begins to occur. You know, I heard a guy recently, I was listening to a, a CD, and I heard a guy talk about what the fourth step really is, is a forgiveness list. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting? Now, you'll hear some lies in AA. Well, I, my sponsor says I should not call them lies. They're simply misconceptions. <clears throat> you'll hear people say there's a different program for everyone in Alcoholics Anonymous. That was made up by the alcoholic that doesn't want to work the program. Because it's really clear what it is. I mean, we have a way out upon which we all agree. We may not even all do it, but we all agree on what it is. It's on most every wall that we walk into. There's only one program. I think there should be a special one for Billy, the good little boy. But there's only one program, and it's time for me to work your program. It's not up to you to adapt yourself to me to make me more comfortable. You've been your own worst enemy. Put yourself at the top of the amends list. You betcha. That'll pretty much kill you, you know. I was not my own worst enemy. I was yours. But you were very self-destructive. Yes, but I didn't know that. I was taking care of myself. I love me. I want me to feel good all the time. I don't ever want to feel bad. Now, if I really want to make amends to myself for the way that I treated myself and the rest of the world, if I put myself at the bottom of that amends list, by the time I get there, I'll have some self-esteem. Now, the big one, the one that kills more people than I think almost anything else, the real big one, the one that really hurts us, I think, more than anything else, or it limits our growth, or it stops this maturing process, is take what you can use and leave the rest. Now repeat that. Doesn't it just sound wrong? I mean, we all kind of like it because it's a great chicken gate. But isn't that how you and I have lived our lives all of our lives? That we took the easy way out, we took what was cute, we took what was belonged to somebody else, we took all the stuff that we wanted and anything that made us the least bit uncomfortable, we left it. I don't ever, I will never consciously put myself in an uncomfortable position. Now, how am I going to change if I feel that way? How am I going to change? What's going to bring about the change in me that's going to cause me to not be that way, to grow up emotionally? I think I say yes to everything. If I'm going to invite this power into my life, if I'm going to invite this power into my life, I have two rules that I try to live by, and I try very, very diligently to live this way. Always answer the phone. Get rid of caller ID. Never don't answer the phone. Always answer the phone whenever it rings because it's always God calling. And I'm not hiding from anybody anymore ever again for the rest of my life. And if you give me the choice of who I want to talk to and who I don't want to talk to, 
with this keen instrument? I don't think so. I think I just need to talk to whoever calls me. Number two, never ever say no. Ever. Always say yes. There are no mistakes. I'm supposed to go there. This power that, uh, that's a power greater than myself that's outside me and around me and inside me. He's now making the decisions. So let's, how do we follow this decision making process? You call me up, you ask me to go somewhere, you ask me to do something, you ask me for help, do you have a few minutes? I mean, it could be any number of things. I just say yes. Now, if I do that, I will end up in uncomfortable positions. I'm in my kitchen 17, 18, 19 years ago, and I'm sponsoring this guy, and his mother's dying. And he left them with my phone number because he knew he would be at my house and and he wanted them to call if she got into trouble. The phone rings and it's the hospital and they say, Al, you better get down here. She's not going to last much longer. He got up to leave, but he wasn't leaving. He just stood there and I knew what he wanted and I did not want to go. I didn't know this guy all that well. I certainly didn't know his mother well. I had never been to the hospital to watch somebody die and I didn't want to go. I was afraid. I didn't want to be inconvenienced. I didn't know what to say. I wasn't in charge. I wasn't the center of attention. The list is huge why I did not want to go with that man. And I said to him, do you want me to go? And he says, would you please? Now he has a family. He has a sister and he has a brother. But for some reason, they feel closer to us than they do their own family. What is that? What is that? I think I should pay attention to that, whatever that is. Now, maybe I don't even think I'm trustworthy, but he trusts me. He trusts me. Now, aren't I seeing myself through his eyes when that happens? He trusts me. He wants me to go with him. So I went and I walked in the room and it was awful. She's all hooked up to tubes and I'm nervous, he's pacing the floor, and I find a chair over in the corner, and I sat down in a chair, and something came over me. A feeling came over me, a very strong feeling. And the feeling was, everything's okay. There's nothing wrong here. Everything's just fine, Bill. It's all right, just relax. And I got this big guy out, he's as big as me, and I sat him down next to me, and I held his hand. And I looked him right in the eye and I said, Al, everything's okay. There's nothing wrong. This is the way it's supposed to be. And we said a prayer. And he's a great big guy and he had a hold of my hand really tight. And as we said the prayer, I could feel his hand relax in mine. That's intimacy. And I miss it all the time because I'm loud and I'm looking for a head rush and I'm thinking about me and I miss it all the time. I need to be taken somewhere else where those things happen because they don't happen in my world. And I want your life. I didn't have much of a life. I need to live your life and I need to let you take me into your world. A friend of mine had a seven-year-old son who died from leukemia. It took him two years. And we went to the hospital. And I was afraid to go in that hospital. And I called my sponsor, and he went with me. In the last several months that little boy was dying, we were there every day. We stood around his bed and held hands and prayed for him to die. He was in such horrible pain. And we talked to his dad, who wouldn't allow them to medicate him because he's a sober guy. And we let him scream at us so he wouldn't scream at the doctors. And the little boy died, didn't have a happy ending. The guy I got sober with, the devil of all liars, Patrick Keelahan, the worst Irish alcoholic you'd ever met in your life, just an awful man. And I loved him with all my heart. And he got lung cancer and he died. He said the most powerful thing I've ever heard in an AA meeting. He said, if you're not grateful, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And I watched him die. Karen and I were both there when, when Patrick passed away. You know, we were in his house with him, held his hand. So when my father came to me and said, I'm sick, and he got cancer, this man that I hated, the man that I made amends to, 
And then ten years later, he made amends to me. He was dying. And my mother and I nursed him, and we changed his diapers, and we took care of him. You had made me ready. I'd seen the face of death. I wasn't afraid. I was emotional. I cried a lot, but I wasn't afraid. I knew what it looked like. And we took care of him. And then a few years later, my mother moved, when she moved in with me, she got cancer and she died in the living room of my house. And I changed her diapers. Something that many of you are sitting out there thinking, oh, I couldn't do that. Yes, you could. When you're standing by the side of the bed and it's time to change the diaper and nobody else is there, what are you going to do? Run? You ask for help. You ask for help. The help comes. She thought she'd lost her dignity, but she hadn't lost her dignity, had she? We reached a new level of intimacy. The first time it was difficult. The second time it was a little bit easier. The third time she goes, Bill, it's time. (laughs) Now let me ask you a question. What if I would have said no to that man in my kitchen that day? What if I would have chosen not to go for any number of reasons? Well, we can't be all things to all people. We're just lay people. There's limitations on what we can do. And I just read the book with you, you know, and and if you don't behave correctly, I'll fire you because, oh, my God, there's an alcoholic behaving badly, you know. (laughs) And, uh, And all these things that we put, the limitations we put on ourselves, we believe that there's all kinds of different forms of 12-step work, so we don't have to do that one. Well, I'm here to report to you that it is my considered opinion after a few years of doing this work that 80% of the program is working with other people. You want to grow up, you want to address your character defects, sponsor people. You'll run into every one. You know, all of them. You'll run into every one of them. That when I get down on my knees and I ask God for help, that I shouldn't turn him away when he shows up. And you can bet... He's not going to look like I think he's going to look like. He's going to look a lot like you, you know. That you are the messengers. You're the ones. God lives in the space between you and I. And the closer I am to you, the closer I am to God. You're the one that I need to pay attention to. You're the one that brings the message to me. And I will go through all kinds of phases in trying to do this work, this grand obsession of trying to reach out and help other alcoholics. There is no other job in Alcoholics Anonymous. Everything else is an activity. And it's a good activity. Activities are great. It's part of being part of a community. But in the bottom line, if I really want to grow up, if I want to feel you in my heart, if I want to feel you in my breast, if I want to be able to feel what you feel when you walk up to me and ask me for help, I will never, ever, ever turn you away. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.